you also mentioned another pretty cool study where um, there was dopamine, dopamine deficient mice mm -hmm. that lacked any sort of motivation even to seek out food to feed themselves. They would rather starve and die than actually go out and um, eat or search for food. And this was like in a contained area where food was right across the cage. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, and that's why sometimes people talk about um, dopamine as being more important for motivation even than it is for the experience of pleasure itself. I would uh, I came across a, uh, uh, a review that made an interesting point um, that initially I thought dopamine and motivation were linear, right? Where as dopamine increases, so does motivation. But um, it's actually a U-shaped phenomenon, right? Where certainly dopamine goes up, motivation goes up, but you do reach a point where if you're like at this supernatural level of dopamine a level where you would that you would uh, that you would get to through cocaine or any any sort of other illicit substances they actually note that motivation goes down right right so again you know our our brains were really evolved for a world of scarcity and ever-present danger where we would have to do a lot of work up front to find the things that keep us alive. And when we found them and ingested them, we would get a little spike of dopamine and mm. that feels good, which would then motivate us to want to continue to get that thing another time. But now we live in this world where we have almost infinite access to so many reinforcing substances and behaviors that we're constantly encountering these very intense dopamine spikes, way more than what our brains were intended for. And so again, as our brains try to compensate for that, we essentially adapt by going into this sub-threshold level of dopamine firing. We're always releasing dopamine at a kind of tonic baseline level, right. and we essentially change our hedonic or joy set point so that now we need way more uh, of the stimulus in, in more potent forms over time, not to get high, but just to go back to normal baseline levels. And when we're not using, we're in this dopamine deficit yeah. state. I wonder what you think. I've been hearing a lot of uh, this advice in regards to motivation where don't wait to get moving, right? Uh, don't wait to get motivated to get moving. Rather, get moving, which will then motivate you. Yes. I wonder what you think uh, within the lens of sort of this dopamine process, what that means to you in terms of that dopamine process. Well, quite literally, um, dopamine is also essential for movement. So um, as you know, when people get Parkinson's disease, that's a movement disorder. It's mm -hmm. characterized by depletion of dopamine in another part of the brain called the substantia nigra. Mm -hmm. And even the most primitive worm will um, move toward the food source in response to a, a dopamine, will release dopamine in response to food in its environment, dopamine allowing it to locomote toward that reward. Mm -hmm. So dopamine and uh, movement and desire are highly connected in the brain through uh, dopamine. And um, we very often when we're working with patients who are trying to overcome addiction, they will often say to us, well, <clears throat> if only I could figure out why I'm addicted. So if only I could think my way through this problem, um, then, you know, I wouldn't be addicted. Mm -hmm. um, but we often say to them, you know, you really have to put actions before thoughts and feelings in this case. If mm -hmm. you wait until you figure out why you're addicted mm -hmm. or until you feel like not using that substance, that day will never come. Sure. And instead, what you need to do is engage in the behaviors of recovery, which then in turn will allow your brain to recalibrate and allow you to see true cause and effect, yeah. which will then bring uh, uh, in following action, you will then start to feel better. So it's again, this idea that in order to really recover um, from these addictive compulsive behaviors, we need to first change the behaviors, right. then let our brain respond to those new signals. Yeah. And then we can make new maps around what that behavior suggests yeah. or causes in our lives. When we're chasing dopamine, it's really hard to see true cause and effect. Mm. But when we get a little bit of distance from them and our brains recalibrate, we can look back and say, oh, wow. Um, and patients will do this all the time. Like, oh, wow, I hadn't realized that, you know, cannabis was having that, that impact on my life or that. Yeah the amount of time that I was spending looking at pornography was causing me to be anxious and depressed, et cetera. Sure. And you mentioned Parkinson's disease. So you, you did bring up a disease state. So I'll bring up one as well. 
What about uh, patients on antipsychotics, mm -hmm. known um, antagonists of dopamine receptors? And these patients aren't necessarily psychotic patients that I have coming in on antipsychotics. They're patients with insomnia, you know? And when you start thinking about, you know, the possible effects that these things are having on motivation and some of these other, you know, human experiences, I wonder what's happening there. What do you think? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it is in indeed true that patients who are on antipsychotics or dopamine blockers for a variety of different reasons do often manifest low mood, um, amotivation, cognitive blunting. So those are real problems. Yeah. Um, and it does raise for the healthcare provider, you know, a discussion of risk benefits and alternatives. Yeah. You know, are, is this medicine helping you more than it's hurting you. And I think those are really valuable and important discussions that we should be having but on the, an ongoing basis. Yeah, but the, the symptoms of decreased motivation and a lot of these things are very nonspecific, right? They might be just bubbling under the surface. They don't have to be so frank. That's very true. And they may be related to the underlying disorder that's trying to be treated, yeah, right? Exactly. So, I mean, we know that, for example, schizophrenia can be associated with an amotivational syndrome. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it can be very hard to tease apart. Yeah. But I, I think I feel very strongly that it's important when our patients come in and say, hey, I feel like I'm having this side effect, this negative effect from this medication, that we have a really open and frank discussion about it yeah. and really validate that that could be being caused by the medicine. And what can we do about it? Can we can we go down on the dose and find a sweet spot where maybe those side effects aren't as intense, but we're still getting the benefit from the medicine? Right. As a corollary, by the way, um, when people with Parkinson's are given L-DOPA, which is a dopamine precursor, um, what we find is that about a quarter of those individuals will actually develop a de novo addiction type of behavioral problem, compulsive gambling, compulsive shopping. Yeah, risky behavior. Right, because right. it's nonspecific, right? We give them... Uh, dopamine, it binds uh, all kinds of receptors in the brain. It helps their Parkinson's disease, so they're moving with more fluidity, but it also binds to receptors in the reward centers and can lead to this kind of addiction diathesis. Yeah. I saw an interesting study in uh, gambling addicts. They gave them L-DOPA, mm -hmm. same medication. Yeah. They were doing more um, risky behaviors as, they were, as related to betting, yeah. but also when they won and experienced a reward, the experience of that reward, they subjectively stated that it was a lot better than had they not been on L-DOPA. Interesting. Thought so it, it was sort of augmented that experience. Yeah. yeah.